Dr. Sandra Foldy, is Professor of Craft History at NASCAD University, uh, that's in Halifax. And she's also the Associate Curator of Fine Craft uh, at the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia. She's the author of numerous books and uh, also working on a new one now. Um, and as one of our most renowned and enthusiastic advocates for craft, she has been instrumental in elevating the level of craft discourse in Canada and abroad. And tonight, we're very fortunate to have her here with us. Please join me in welcoming Sandra Foldy. Oh, she set the bar high. <laughs> thank you, Grace. And thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. I understand it's a busy cultural evening in Winnipeg, and I appreciate you choosing craft. I'd also like to thank the Manitoba Craft Council. I think it's significant that I'm here in Manitoba giving this lecture, which is an exploration of the impact of women's craft activity on their social, personal, and economic well-being because my great-grandmother, Martha Jane Elliott, in 1918 uh, was a board member of the United Farm Women of Manitoba, where she was put in charge of young people's work. In this capacity, she drew upon Manitoban DIY talents by organizing quilting bees, like the one shown on the right, where the quilts that were produced were used as fundraisers to create spaces in Manitoba towns for the wives and the children of farmers who would come in with their husbands and fathers while the farm business was being conducted. And she also used these quilts as a rather subversive fundraiser for the suffragette activities that she was doing in the province. She worked very closely with Nellie McClung here. So the quilts are mostly long gone, and none of the quilts belong to a specific artist. So these are the perfect examples of anonymous DIY crafting that was being used to bring benefits to all women across Manitoba. So in that spirit, tonight I'd like to argue that DIY will never die. Scene one, a sunny spring day. An eccentrically dressed woman slowly climbed up the banks of James Bay in Victoria, British Columbia, carrying two buckets of clay. She's heading home to refine the clay, transforming it into a series of small ashtrays, bowls, and platters. They sell like hotcakes at the local craft fairs, especially when the tourists are in town. She relies on this income to survive, but most importantly, she relies on the creative work to keep herself sane. Scene two, a sunny spring day. An eccentrically dressed woman does a delicate balancing act on a folding chair as she hangs a line to display her hand silk screen embroidered and hand sewn clothing. They sell like hotcakes at this nationally renowned indie craft fair, especially when the tourists are in town. She relies on this income to survive, but more importantly, she relies on the creative work to keep herself sane. <coughs> Emily Carr, star of scene one, and this is her killer whale hooked rug from circa 1929, created thousands of utilitarian ceramic objects and hooked rugs between the years 1913 and 1927. This craft work was not her life passion. Large-scale abstracted painting was. But during these difficult economic times, she relied upon the souvenir appeal of craft to survive, writing, quote, I made hundreds and hundreds of stupid objects, the kind that tourists <laughs> pick up. I could bake as many as 500 small pieces at one firing. As well, they successfully displayed the West Coast native images she appropriated, something she recognized as problematic, lamenting, quote, I ornamented my pottery with Indian designs. That was why the tourists bought it. I hated myself for prostituting Indian art. Our Indians did not pot. Their designs were not intended to ornament clay, but I did keep the Indian designs pure. Despite her frustrations over not being able to work into the male-dominated world of painting, Carr was able to take control over all aspects of her rug hooking and her ceramic production. It provided her with an avenue of creative expression, despite her feeling that it was often a step in the wrong direction. Kathy Sever, owner of a monster in Austin, Texas, and star of scene two, is a fabric and clothing designer who has pretty much stopped making the utilitarian wear and has shifted over into um, gallery exhibitions. But she attended art school and intended to become a painter 
until a move to Montana changed her mind. Quote, there in Montana were all these people who were so far removed from the art world, but who were infusing everything that they did with this amazing creative flair. And to me, it felt so much more solid and real to be making something that was going to be purposeful for somebody. She had abandoned painting altogether for her clothing, and she ornaments them with these wonderful, unapologetically kitschy cowboy and Indian scenes and phrases. The differences and similarities between Emily Carr and Kathy Sever separated over time, but united in their pursuit of independence through craft production, provide a risky and tenuous connection. Risky because of the impulse to essentialize through gender, materials, and race, and further, to use this romanticization to create the idea of a homogenous craft community somehow magically linked over time. It's tenuous because the do-it-yourself DIY generation is largely resistant to historical precedents. They jeopardize the project of freshness. However, obvious associations do exist. Tonight, I would like to examine the tensions and the overlaps between today's DIY pioneers and the pioneering studio craft women who preceded them in order to ask this question. Is history simply repeating itself? And what are the elements that keep DIY alive and financially vital across generations? In our historical terms, the question becomes more pressing. This is more than a straightforward project of naming influential women. It's a materialist feminist examination of the gaps that exist between contemporary makers and their foremothers. And Tanya Herod, the wonderful British craft historian, observes, quote, women can drop out of the already fragile history of the crafts with alarming ease. A point expanded upon by Kirsty Robertson, a Canadian craft historian who notes, quote, those who are remembered, those whose few lives and careers are archived against erasure, run the risk of being pulled into a narrative that smooths edges and purges the idiosyncratic in an effort to create this initial history of women in the crafts. So opening up a discussion of the associations between women who broke new ground in the studio craft movement and the young women driving today's DIY movement reveals that conflicts between professional and amateur are still very much still in existence, as are the unmentioned gender, racial, and class ideals surrounding craft all factors that influence the craft economy we occupy at the moment. Scene three. There is great excitement as the first yards of fabric are sold at the workshop. Maybe this project of reviving hand block printing is viable after all. She's so happy that her background as a painter allowed her to understand the color and pattern structures necessary for producing excellent textiles. Scene four. There's great excitement as the first yards of fabric are sold at the craft fair she initiated. Maybe this project of reviving hand block printing is viable after all. She's so happy that her background as a painter allowed her to understand the color and pattern structures necessary for producing excellent textiles. Phyllis Barron, star of scene three, and this is a piece she created with Dorothy Larcher, Old Flower, was formally trained as a painter, but as early as 1905, she began experimenting with hand block printing fabric that drew upon her knowledge of French peasant textiles. In 1925, she was joined by the painter Dorothy Larcher, who had observed dyeing and hand block printing while living in India. Baron and Larcher fabrics found their market through the Omega workshop and later in the Weaver Ethel Murray shop, and they went on to receive commissions from the Duke of Westminster for his yacht, The Flying Cloud, as well as his houses in England and France. And Rosheen Fagan, star of scene four, completed her BFA at the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design in 2005. Frustrated by the lack of outlets for her hand-printed textiles, she spearheaded the Halifax Crafters Market, which is growing from a group of local uh, crafters. Fagan re founded repeatstudio.com with her fellow NASCADers, and has gone on to secure outlets for her textiles across North America. As both examples demonstrate, the hierarchy between studio craft, DIY, and fine art can be easily inverted. But art history and often protectionist craft history are quick to delineate between camps. Uh, Dennis Stevens writes in American Craft Magazine, quote, today, studio craft is recognized as valuing skill, connoisseurship, and tradition, and its social structure seems to generate the need for educational and professional hierarchies. 
In contrast, DIY craft emerges from a culture that does not seek professional validation within traditional art methodology, but rather is motivated by joining with others socially in shared creative activity. And this is a shot from the Renegade Craft Fairs 2009. And many craft historians like Dennis Stevens have identified these craft fairs as being the outpouring of community. Studio craft and DIY in particular are popular culture. And if you just go to any magazine shop and go to the craft section, you'll find that there are just endless numbers of magazines. And of course, you can't say that craft is popular culture without putting Michaels up anywhere. Studio craft tends to resist this relationship, drawing a line between uh, itself, this hobby world, and the professional world, whereas DIY embraces it. In Thinking Through Craft, Glenn Adamson provides a sophisticated analysis of this perilous train between amateurism and professionalism, writing, quote, when craft manifests itself as an expression of amateurism, it becomes genuinely troublesome as a result of the lack of critical distance from objects of desire. In the popular imagination, hobby crafts are on a par with such activities as stamp collecting and hobby sport. Activities done in the spirit of self-gratification rather than critique. On the other hand, this spirit of self-gratification is abundantly evident in the DIY ethos. But, on the other side of things, this educated knowledge base behind many DIY makers allows them to play with ideas of amateur and kitsch. Scene 5. The loom is placed in the center of the living room, where it was tripped over, cursed, but always present. After her second marriage dissolves, she finds herself, quote, living in her business rather than weaving in her home. Selling her handmade objects is a strong statement on the role of industry in capitalist society, but it's also vital to her own survival. Scene six. The studio is one door down from the bedroom and right beside the bathroom. The house sits in a suburb, but the home is all about her business and subversively infiltrating the capitalist market. Selling her handmade objects is a strong statement on the role of industry in capitalist society, but it's also vital to her own survival. Ethel Murray, the star of scene five and shown here at her loom, no date, um, Ethel Murray's dates herself were 1872 to 1952. Star of scene five, returned from Sri Lanka in 1907 and made her home, Norman Chapel, into her studio and eventually the site of her business. In her excellent article on Ethel Murray in Textile, the Journal of Cloth Culture, Kirsty Robertson outlines how she went on to establish a successful weaving business despite the fact that, quote, Murray constructed herself under and was constructed by a patriarchal society. According to Margot Coates, Marie's success was because she avoided, quote, descending into arty, crafty, or precious work. But Robertson points out that craft historians like Coates, along with Christopher Frayling and Alan Crawford, describe Marie's business acumen in terms of her intuitive female instincts rather than her intellectual financial capabilities. Jenny Hart, the owner of Sublime Stitching and star of Scene 6, is part of what's known as the Austin Craft Mafia, a successful group of women who are the stars of the DIY Network's television programs. She runs Sublime Stitching from her ranch-style home in Texas, but argues, quote, that she's taking it from a different angle. Hart does not question the need to earn a living from her craft work, nor did Murray. Yet both their businesses have been interpreted as representing an anti-capitalist or anti-industry stance. And I think that this idea that studio craft and DIY occupy these positions is of course based on their historical lineage to the arts and crafts movement.